Thank you very much, dear moderator. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for staying with us. It's been a long day, and I'm very honored to be the moderator、um, for the fifth session of today's conference. Net Zero Challenge for Corporate Supply Chains in the Brown Economy, and we are very honored to have three panelists. They come from different backgrounds, and I believe they will share with you different perspectives. The first panelist is Mr. Wang Houcheng, Director Wang Houcheng, De- Department of General Planning, Ministry of Labor. Um, he's not here yet, but actually we talked. Um, during the break, he's coming he, to join us very soon. And our second panelist is Mr. Su Hanbang. He is vice president of Taiwan Research Institute. He is an energy expert. Last but not least, Miss Sun Xingxuan. She is a researcher at Environmental Rights Foundation. So our three panelists,、um, they are from the government. Research Institute, and from other parts of society, and I think they have、um, profound experiences and knowledge. Especially one of them is from think tank. Whether it's about sustainability or the rights to environment for for the society and the people. Um, I think our dear panelists can share with us very different and inspiring perspectives.、Um, Mr. Wang Houcheng, Director Wang,、um, thank you for joining us. Now, shall we start the session?、Um, each panelist would have fifteen minutes for the presentation. Now, let's welcome Director Wang. Thank you, Professor Lin, Vice President Su, and also、uh, Ms. Sun, researcher from Environmental Rights Foundation, and distinguished guests here. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to share with you、um, my perspective on Net Zero Challenge for Corporate Supply Chains in the Brown Economy. Here is my agenda. After industrial revolution, as we talk about the ground economy, certainly that covers fossil fuel, natural gas, and oil, etc. All these、um, different elements of brown economy will change our economy. And due to this brown economy, we have seen、um, climate change, and that is irreversible. And by twenty fifty, we. Aim to achieve net zero, and that is our align goal. And actually, last year, President Lai,、um, he mentioned that digital transformation and net zero transformation. These are the dual principle, the dual driver for the nation economy. And we are developing a smarter and more sustainable Taiwan. And in other policies, it also、um, all these policies all. Outline the same goal that by twenty fifty we shall achieve net zero. Speaking of net zero, this year、um, in European Union, CBAM is taking ef- effect, and this is very important not only for the industry but also for the National Development Council, for Ministry of Economic Affairs,、um, in different units in the department or in the private sector. People are paying attention to this. And in EU、uh, now, with the implementation of this new policy, they are having a stricter standard for、um, carbon emission. That's the same case for the United States. That is,、um, if your product exporting to US and EU and not achieving carbon emission standard, then you will have to pay extra tax. In Taiwan, I think very soon we will announce、um, carbon tax,、um, a new regulation. And actually, this year, European、um, EU Parliament,、um, they are going to ratify CSDDD. That is.、Um, 
CSDDD defines the different aspects for environmental rights as well as、um, human rights in this context. So, I will skip a few slides. And in just transition, as we have elaborated this topic throughout the day, certainly labor right is very important. And just transition is not exactly a new idea, but it started with the industrial revolution. And looking at the rights of the labor is not just about their rights, but also. The interaction and also the rights for the consumers, for the people in the community, whether the rights of these people are protected in the process of just of transformation. And as I'm from Ministry of Labor, I think for us, all these rights for the people and only for the labor are very important. It's the key of our policies. Um, let's come back to this agenda. Well, we all agree that Taiwan plays an important role. In the global supply chain, because we are a exporting economy. So actually, in the future,、um, as we can see、uh, for EU and United States, because、um, they are also our big exporter exporting market. So for in the future, the companies as、um, they will have to deal with the carbon emission quantification and also the human rights. Um, issues. These are the aspects that we、we'll、have to pay attention to. And here are four dimensions that we have to focus on in the future just transition. As I mentioned, how do we upskill? How do we foster the cap capability and capacity of the、um, workers? This could be one big issue, and also the shortage of. Capable labor. So now, as people are talking about green economy, but where can we find qualified workers or people to fulfill this agenda? And certainly, as the industries change, the labor conditions will change. So, in the process for the labor, certainly the working environment will be different. However, in the process terms of transition, there could be some structural unemployment, and there will be a lot of layoffs and loss of jobs. And for the fragile segment, especially for women,、um, middle-aged and senior people, and also the、uh, physically challenged people, their rights will be affected. And also, as we see. When we embrace a new energy, there will be new technology, new process, and new risks.、Uh, for example, recently in Taiwan,、um, as we were producing、um, wind turbines to be installed in the sea,、um, in the process, actually there are lots of delicate and subtle issues. And the last element. The employer and employee discussion,、um, as you have heard in the previous discussion,、um, social dialogue. Yes, it sounds easy, but in our current structure, is very often the、um, labor discussion. Very often, is the union、um, having a conversation with the employers. However, in many companies, the unions they have very low position, and more than ninety percent. Of the small and medium-sized industries, their unions are very weak. And now, in the Ministry of Labor, we have two main policies supporting just transition. So, in our twelve key indicators in the process transition, the Ministry of Labor, um, we support the. Capacity building of the laborers and also the unemployment flexibility, and also we are facilitating、um, training on site, meaning that when they are employed, we are trying to offer them second skills. For example,、um, wind turbines, how the maintenance and also、um, the under uh, uh, underwater、um, electric. 
assignment. And also in the future, as we look into hydrogen power, um, what are the issues that might be brought up? So in the process of this transition, how can we build up a benign and friendly communication between the employers and the workers? And when there are disputes, how do we settle the disputes? And very often, as we look at, there are different age brackets in the labors. How do we offer different level of support? And in some industries, you can see um, they have certain traits. It could be they, their age is relatively higher, or they have specific, specific issues that only take place in the industry. So if the transition fails, what happened to the labor? Yes, the, um, the government may offer subsidies, and if their skill is proper, we can support them to find a second job. And it could be there's another issue um, as they are um, upscaling, upscaling themselves. Um, how can we guarantee they have a basic um, level of life support? So in our training, actually in March this year, we work with um, Taiwan University of Technology. We work together and set up a green energy talent training center. And actually, Minister of Labor, we are looking into the possibility of working with academic um, institutions to offer training in this aspect. Some trainings will be held by MOL, um, whereas some others are co-organized. Co and for those who are entitled for labor pension, um, they can apply for training. And in the past, for labor pension, um, there are different qualification of the um, identity, and they can receive different levels of training or benefits. But now it's different. So most um, pension owners or receivers, um, they can apply for, for training. And for companies, they can look at their needs and ask for um, training sessions to be tailor-made for their needs. And also, we have um, other projects, for example, um, study or learning projects offered. And we are introducing vocational training on green technology, circular economy. And also this year, like I mentioned, we will work with even more schools. And if in the situation when the company or the laborers cannot complete the transition, then we will ask the company to present a list of laborers, and we will support this list of laborers to support them uh, to go through this process. And in different counties and cities, we have employment center. We can offer support to citizens in need. And speaking of union relationships, um, we make sure labor rights are guaranteed, protected in the process of transition. And for example, recently we just set up a um, labor protection for wind energy. For example, um, in new technology, um, there are new vocational uh, safety guidelines, etc. When there are disputes, our settlement measure um, for example, four years ago, um, we passed a new act. Um, it was helpful to um, labor rights litigations. And we have accelerated the process, meaning that from application to um, implementation, the process has been implemented. And also, we have um, this emergency um, alert system and it comes with employment service, consultation, etc. We will try to delay and dilute the impact from the loss of jobs. And like I mentioned, um, these are the three pillars we wanted to set up to safeguard labor through just transition. So number one, 
is、um, training when they are employed. To,、uh, they receive training to prepare themselves better. And secondly,、um, the corporate resilience.、Um, I think having transparent information is very important. And then certainly vocational hazard prevention. And leaving no one behind is the key principle. And for Taiwan and the world, we are aligned. We want to deliver this、um, zero emission goal together with the world. Thank you. And maybe our、um, next speaker. Thank you, moderator,、uh, Mr. Wang, Professor Zhou. Good afternoon. My name is Su Hanbang from the、uh, Taiwan Research Institute. Uh, our organization has long been a partner of a lot of government projects in、uh, net zero and renewable energy. So I'd like to you、uh, talk about this topic from an economic perspective, especially focusing on、uh, the conditions in the capital and the market environments. So my topic today is to strengthen information. Disclosure, corporate information disclosure. From EU's relevant regulation, we see that companies could、uh, do a lot of things to participate more in the capital market. It's important to have participation from the private sector.、Uh, another key is the product market. So, for example, carbon pricing,、uh, cost internalization, CBAM, leverage. These tools are leveraged to、uh, build a positive environment. So today, I would talk about these、uh, in the brief time I have today. How do I go to the next slide? Right. So here's my outline. First, I will talk about international trends. We'll look at、uh, EU's practices. They are fit for a 55 package. How do they use that to、uh, build a friendly environment that incentivizes companies to cut carbon emissions? Uh, we know in recent years,、uh, as the world gears towards a net zero future, a lot of companies are preparing for it.、Uh, I think there are three drivers or three、uh, ways. First, top down through regulation, authority requires companies to cut carbon at a certain time point. So in Taiwan, we have、uh, the climate. Change Response Act, carbon pricing mechanism. Internationally, we saw CBAM.、Uh, importers need to comply with、uh, EU CBAM rules. So that's the first、uh, pressure, so to speak. Companies need to address. And another way is inside out. We are seeing、uh, more and more climate-related、uh, lawsuits. Much of these cases,、uh, many of these cases, arise from information asymmetry, so lack of transparency in information disclosure. So we see、uh, more and more enforcements. For example, FSCs and other authorities、uh, launching regulations in this regard. The third way is、uh, outside in. So, as the department chief mentioned, Taiwan is an export-oriented、uh, market. We are affected by、uh, world economics. So, international conditions.、Uh, Affect massively how we work towards sustainable development.、Uh, initiatives in the、uh, private sector are also very important. 
for businesses to stay competitive worldwide, they need to go low carbon. They need to use green energy. They need to be sustainability minded. So, here you see, starting from、uh, the IPCC target, they said if we want to reach this target,、uh, we need to reach net zero by which year. And then EU was is actually a pioneer. In 2019, they、uh, announced their Green Deal, and then it started an international trend. Now over 148 countries、um, have pledged their net zero targets. Taiwan is also among one of them. So, in our country,、uh, in Ta Taiwan, Taiwan plays a key role in the global supply chain, and we are an export. Uh, dependent country, we see、um, over sixty percent of big companies worldwide have made their net zero pledges. So, if the private sector doesn't make any change, if companies don't make any change,、uh, they will lose their competitiveness. They would be barred from participating in the market. So, in addition to net zero targets, international trends,、uh, there are also several key drivers. First, from the product market; second, from the capital market. So,、uh, as I mentioned, information disclosure is important. But why is it related to、uh, product market?、Uh, companies need money. Investors. Banking industry could provide money, but when there is information asymmetry, if that exists in the financial market, then that it would be a big barrier to、uh, achieving a supply demand balance. So we saw in the beginning from the equator principles till now, different sets of principles and standards are launched. And then a CSRD, and then for human rights we have CSDDD. So different these、uh, different sets of rules and standards place、uh, focus on information disclosure on transparency. And I think we will see more of these rules and standards incorporated into corporate、uh, culture. Or linked to their credit rating. So, Green Deal from EU is a systemic approach to address this issue. So it details how different measures could be leveraged to、uh, through、uh, to use fifty actions for twenty fifty. And I think you all are familiar with this.、Uh, it seeks to use capital to drive change, to drive technology advancements, and then、uh, benefit many related sectors. In Taiwan, we focus more on IEA, but in EU's Green Deal version, I think、uh, it's using capital to drive change. And to drive different applications, the logic is similar, but maybe it's used in different ways because、uh, we are different economies. So EU has used this、uh, business management model, like TS. It requires different departments to propose their own roadmap or timeline. And then they are reviewed to ensure they can be delivered. So this is a very scientific approach to make sure、uh, it's enforced. So this is how EU、uh, monitors its policy enforcement. So using data to verify. To monitor policy, I think this is very meaningful and important. So I'm in the process of、um, promotion. 
and implementing this implementing this pathway as they have this um, rolling estimates and rolling review. Um, but you see, 2050 is not really far away. So actually, by the end of 2019, actually they set up a 2020 um, midterm project. So I want to introduce to you this um, Fit for 55. Um, they target their product market, also the capital market. They look at the capacity building. They have um, presented this systematic um, regulation. And it's a model that a lot of countries around the world have, have been studying and try to learn from them. For example, the carbon border control. Um, they are internalizing the carbon cost in EU. And also, they once and for all integrate the different regulations um, in different countries and have that integrated regulations linked with the different products. And also, they will look at the capital, capital provider, and the um, demand for the capital. They would pull the stakeholders together and sometimes matchmaking these different stakeholders so that they can have a more united front. So this carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM, how come, why is that they put it in a 50-50 fit, a midterm um, goal? Because, yeah, eventually when you have um, net zero, then you don't have to pay a carbon tax. And actually, for them, carbon border adjustment mechanism is like an accelerator. And because it's a midterm um, goal and also accelerator, once we get these carbon taxes or this uh, capital, we can leverage all these resources to do a lot of things. And if you do not um, stay in line with the CBAM, then actually you are missing opportunity. And for CBAM, actually, it's now becoming a global topic. For example, in um, EU, they have carbon tax. And in Taiwan, because we haven't ratified the um, regulations yet, so they're asking for extra uh, tax. Is it fair? And speaking of um, fairness, a fair competition, do you think all parties are fair? And say, for example, Apple, if they are in the left side and they are setting um, plants in this market. And can I, for example, set up my plant in areas where there is no um, carbon leak? And then I import the products back to um, evade this taxation? Well, that's one issue. And last but not least, since I have, um, we have um, limit a limited time, um, how do we define sustainability? Actually, it would be an artistic question. For EU, in their midterm um, goal, they have this EU taxonomy. And with this taxonomy, um, and the bottom left, from step one to step two, um, they internalize this um, taxonomy to evaluate the different stakeholders, the different companies, to evaluate the information disclosed. And with this internalization, that means the companies, they have to take actions in the process of transition. And for the industry, because they need money, they have this demand for capital, the internalization, internalization means that if they incorporate these ideas in their production, then actually they, it, it will be easier for them to access capital. So it's more like building a green financing environment in the capital market and in line with human rights and also other um, references. The process is really a systemat systematic approach. And for EU, they only spend two years to complete this mechanism. <laughs> well, I'll skip this slide. And for financial market, this taxonomy, um, like I said, it's internalized, integrated into different companies. And the capital market, well, actually, it, it wasn't really a solid line because in the future, if we look at the credentials of these companies, the ratings, I mean, that would be the further step. So for EU, 
Now they are looking at the big company, also public companies. But in the future, will this impact spread to other parts of the world? I believe、um, a lot of big companies around the world they will be thinking about this issue. And for the last two slides, I think I do not have time to elaborate.、Um, this slide is about CSRD,、um, and that means we. Enhance NFRD, and now it's CSRD. So it actually it actually requires third party confirmation. And for SFDR, it's targeting the financial、um, institute stakeholders. So as you can see, there are different colors for different grading. So all this, this is my observation as I look into how the EU and、um, build up a. Green finance environment for the capital market. So my time is up.、Um, these are really simple、um, information. Maybe I stay at second to last page.、Um, for companies, the challenges or the difficulties could be new opportunities. So for a company, as we have these three pillars to manage: carbon management, corporate governance, and also green trading. I think this is something we all have to go through, but from the product market, if we want to maintain this green competitiveness throughout Taiwan, then carbon management and also carbon information integration,、um, that's very important because、um, in the future, all companies or supply chain will be asking for this information, and the green circle, the blue circle, and I believe they will be the key driver for our green competitiveness. Thank you very much. So thank you for this wonderful sharing.、Oh, yeah, we are sorry that you do not have any time to go through all the pages. And next,、um, I would like to have、um, Sun Xingxuan, researcher for Environmental Rights Foundation. Thank you, Professor Ling. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying with us, our dear friends here and online. So actually,、um, we have.、Um, Listen to all the speeches, discussion, things we are doing, we want to do, what we are doing here, and what other countries are doing. Now, please just close your eyes for a moment, just a moment. Then just imagine after all these lessons, these speeches, after this long day, what is the sustainable future? For example, now. That our eyes are closed. Can you imagine the solar panels in the city, or when you are standing by the crossroads? There is no more、um, odor、um, from the cars. There is no emission, and the city is cleaner. It's greener and more part of blue sky that you can see now. Open your eyes. So can you imagine something like this?、Uh, like I mentioned, we have green building. And also, we have、um, renewable energy, and also a very popular market, the electric vehicles. And here, I would like to share with you if, with our current progress, and also our current supply chain models, our business models, if we continue business as usual, our future will become like this. Will be brown. Actually, these photos. Were taken in my trip to Indonesia just this March this year, so it's a nickel lors. So for nickel is a key element for the batteries for electric vehicles, and also we're building all this renewable energy、um, power grid. Nickel is a very important element. So this is a nickel lor, a mine, a mining city in Indonesia. So, but it's not really an industrial park. It's actually a village. You see a lot of people, children, and old, young and old. They live in this place. So at the bottom left, um, it looks like dirty water, but actually it's a river. And I saw children. They were bathing. They were washing clothes in this river. And also, you see this um, coal power plant. It's Built by a Taiwanese company, and right next to it, it's a、um, high school. So you see, this all. I mean, this is really familiar, right? It's a something we have seen before in Taiwan, right? So for Nico Lord,、um, according to the latest statistics from IEA,、um, 
the demand for nickel would double in twenty by twenty fifty, and for the critical minerals, um, they are actually um six times growth, and for nickel is just double. It is not really much, and for Indonesia, is one of the biggest. They have one uh, some of the biggest. Nickel mines and nickel ores, and also they have these extracting、um, facilities. Also, Indonesia. I'm sharing this with you is not about how scary it could be in the process of transition, but I just want to assert a gentle reminder here: what is the real the real idea of sustainability? How can we make sustainability sustainability better? For example, the green,、uh, the blue skies, the clear waters can stay as we grow. And another question I would like to discuss with you is that a lot of European American companies, a lot of countries, have noticed such situation. So they have stipulated、um, powerful laws. But in Taiwan, there is no regulation in this aspect. So my outline for today,、um, I will be talking about CSDDD, and then I will talk about what's happening in Taiwan. So CSDDD actually it's been ratified and actually it's taking effect within twenty days, meaning、um, companies in Taiwan will have to comply with this new law. So what is really CSDDD? Um, first of all, it's covering、um, companies around the world, and you see, for a company that has more than one thousand employees, including、um, part-time employees, and when their net revenue exceeds four hundred fifty million euros, then they are covered in CSDDD. And if you are not a U N A U company, however, your revenue, your profit. If you're doing business in the European、uh, Union countries and that exceeds four hundred fifty million, and if you are not complying with CSDDD, then you will be sued. And because it takes time for different countries to ratify the law, so it takes some time, but no later than twenty twenty nine. The the threshold and also um the regulations would take effective would take effect, and also this apply to the mother company of a group. So say you are a big holding company serving as the mother of the group, and maybe you are not qualified for the for the threshold because it's really a high threshold. But as a group, if your the whole group is qualified, meaning the um all the number of the employees. Um, exceeds and also net revenue, etc. That even if you're just a mother company, you are under.、Um, you need to comply with CSDDD. So here are some key points. For example,、uh, number one, for instance, the core value of CSDDD,、um, the activity chain, chain of activities. So. In this CSDDD framework, the company will have to deliver due diligence, including company itself and also、um, sub company. And so, what is chain of activities? Chain of activities will be covered in due diligence. So it's like the upper link and also down link. Your business partners,、um, it constitutes the chain of activities. And that's because I mean, in the process of stipulating this law, they pe-、uh, stakeholders all made some compromise. It's because, for example, a private sector, they say if you are doing this、um, due diligence, there may be just the down link. But say, let's take the、um, Indonesian nickel, or for example, if I am a、um, e vehicle maker, and Then, according to CSDDD, the、um, chain of activities, a、uh, chain of activities, would go as far as car makers, and also the battery makers. Or、so、maybe um ten or twenty years ago, uh, uh ten or twenty years later, when you need to recycle the battery in your e vehicle, the shipping companies will be covered in this chain activities. But in chain of activities. 
um, to be governed by CSDDD, that's only the um, shipping company, and you have to deliver due diligence for this shipping company. And secondly, companies need to conduct human rights and environmental due diligence and engage in meaningful communication during the progress a process with stakeholders. Uh, we're all familiar uh, with this, but the key is that it needs to be consistent. It needs to happen regularly. It can be a one-time thing. So, for example, uh, if you want to enter a new market, you need to evaluate whether your activities will have an impact on the community, on the labor, then you need to engage with uh, the stakeholders, right? If there might be risks, you need to have uh, corresponding measures. You also need to communicate these measures with stakeholders. So it, it has to happen consistently all the time during each step. The company needs to identify proactively uh, the stakeholders, engage with them. There also has to be a, a re complaint mechanism in place. So if a stakeholder identifies themselves as a stakeholder, they can, through this complaint mechanism, to file a complaint. So uh, companies can identify who's stakeholder, who's labor, who is community, who are my stakeholders. But in the EU regulation, uh, you need to also set a complaint mechanism so that self-identified stakeholders could engage you. And the third point is transparency. You need to provide complete information on for stakeholders. The fourth is information request. Uh, in Taiwan, companies could uh, make the information they want to provide open. But under CSDDD, if a stakeholder deems a certain piece of information relevant material, they have the right to ask the company to publish it. They can put out this request, but the company can deny the request, but they need to provide a reasonable uh, reason or justification. So at the end of the day, if in the worst case scenario, companies would need to court, need to go to the court and explain why they decline, why they reject uh, to disclose certain information. So more details can be found in this uh, OECD due diligence guidance. I would love to have more time to talk about what are covered, right? Human rights, environment, there are so many details, but uh, there are more details in the slides. Please see, uh, read through them if you like. Now I'd like to talk about the third one. So uh, investigation. It's not really about investigation because in the morning we also heard about speakers talking about management. So it's not only about investigation. Afterwards, you need to um, develop corresponding measures, execute them and monitor them and review them to make an improvement. So it doesn't end with investigation. You need to monitor the performance of measures. You need to collect feedback from your stakeholders. So these are all uh, defined uh, in CSDDD. And the fourth, penalties. If you fail to uh, carry out your obligations, though the, the maximum fines it are at least 5% of your net turnover worldwide. Uh, also, you would be civilly liable for if you breach your due diligence obligations. So 90% of companies in Taiwan are SMEs. So such high penalty, uh, such high obligation, are they feasible? So in CSDDD also requires bigger companies to support and assist SMEs in carrying out these obligations. So big companies need to prove themselves, need to, care, need to pay for the third-party verification fees, and we need to hash out 
clearer framework for the Taiwan context. So coming back to the topic of today, climate transition plan. So it requires companies to execute, implement their plan. So the plan is designed to ensure the company's uh, business models, operational strategies are aligned to the Paris Agreement. But here it also say, says that you need to set five-year targets for tw between 2030 to 2050. And also making a commitment is not enough. You need to specify what measures are you going to take, what changes are you going to introduce, technologies to adopt in your plan. And transition is costly. So companies in this plan need to specify where they're going to get the money for transition from, from stakeholders, from, so, so that shareholders and stakeholders could review your plan and see if you are really committed. A remedy, uh, just a, a few things. Under CSDDD, remedy is not limited to financial compensation. You don't just quantify and uh, crunch the numbers. The core idea of remedy is to ask the company restore the environment or human rights to the to a state before the violation occurs. So you don't you can't just pay the money and end the end the thing. But I don't have time to go through it, so I would just skip it. Um, and now we are seeing more and more uh, markets, countries worldwide launching their regulations. I know time is up. So here you see we are seeing a growing uh, number of lawsuits related to due diligence. So it's really worldwide. Just give me 60 seconds more. So uh, in Taiwan, there are also many practices or policies or regulations and the key focus in this is disclosure, but disclosure is not the same as implementation. So like TCFD, they're doing a great job, but is there a penalty? No. So we want to see more action and CSDDD is a great tool to ensure uh, implementation by these companies. Otherwise, penalties will be dished out. Uh, two recommendations for Taiwan. For human rights, for environmental protection, or net zero, or competitiveness, we need to quickly build uh, an environment that could foster uh, a positive, a comprehensive due diligence mechanism. We already have a draft. We have already done consultation. I think we need to step up and accelerate the pace so that we can be a leader uh, in Asia in regulation. Imagine if you are a, a, a brand, a Western brand, you need to do business with an Asian market. Uh, those that do good, do proper due diligence will be your first choice for engagement. So it also helps competitiveness. And then a national contact point. Um, we've discussed this quite a lot in uh, the, the private sector. So we need to set a corporate and human right national contact point equivalent to the OECD specs. So it would be in charge of providing information, stakeholder coordination and assisting companies in align in complying with international standards, also uh, addressing stakeholder complaints. So this would help uh, civic groups, uh, stakeholders. This is also important for the industry because with information asymmetry, companies don't always know what's happening in the upstream sector. But with this, uh, companies would be able to know, for example, in their tier four suppliers, there are big issues that they are unaware of. And then that need, they need to take measures, take actions. So this is important. So that, that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, researcher Ms. Sun, for her brilliant, brilliant sharing. We've learned really a lot from all three presenters.
Now we have around 20 minutes for a Q&A session. We'll now open the floor. If you have any questions, feel free to raise them. And please also state who you want to direct your question to. Uh, if not, then uh, I would select a speaker to answer your question. Uh, also, feel free to share uh, your feedback and your opinions. Now the floor is open. Yes, please. Professor, uh, Department Chief, uh, Researcher, Good afternoon. Uh, I'm from the Department of Korean Languages from the Zhengzhi, National Zhengzhi University. I, I realize that ESG is a really broad topic. My question is, if I want to be in uh, the green industry, how do I stay competitive in this industry and uh, build my my capabilities, ESG capabilities. So uh, a lot of people are also uh, getting certificates, ESG certificates to stay competitive. So I was wondering, is it necessary? Uh, do I need to spend a lot on getting those credentials if I want to be in this industry? That's Thank you for your question. Maybe we will collect more questions and then we will have the panelists answer all the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I'm from the Department of Forestry in National Taiwan University. My question is in the development of ESG, the issues that companies pay attention to, will the scope be different because of locality? Um, of the issue. For example, in Asia, uh, many countries' um, issues in human rights usually receive less attention compared to others. And also, uh, this may due to the shortage of um, indicators or the um, measurement frameworks. But um, I would like to know how you look at it. How? Thank you for the question. Any other question? Hi, I'm TJ from New Economy Paper, Taiwan. Yes, um, as I listen to the presentation, it sounds like we are having this due diligence investigation starting 2024. I'm not very sure this question could be directed to which panelist, uh, to uh, but um, for CSDDD, so far from my understanding, it looks like there's no um, financial institutions yet, uh, whether in their financing or their credit review, CSDDD is not yet covered in the review process. So how should we start that? Because in KYC and also the um, credit process. Already we are doing a lot of ESG investigations. But um, what is your recommendation for starting CSDD or covering that in our um, credit review? So um, maybe we will have the questions for the panelists. Maybe one panelist, one question. So the first question, let me rephrase it. Um, to find a qualified professional in this aspect. For example, it could be a labor promotion or capacity building. I mean, for a youngster, for a young college student, how can we foster our abilities? And number two, it's in corporate governance. Um, maybe Ms. Sun can answer the second question. And the third question, 
our Vice President Su, he mentioned energy and economy, um, the related topics, I mean, um, for credit review, maybe it's part of or related to his presentation, maybe we'll have Vice President Su answering the third question. Okay, thank you very much. To answer the question, yes, indeed. In the market, um, we are seeing a lot of training sessions, and actually they are costly. Like I said, as I have introduced to you, this past March, we worked with Taiwan University of Technology. We worked with them to offer a training for green energy. And actually, on the Ministry of Labor, we have um, different units. And actually, we have five local offices. They will work with um, local um, schools or university um, education institutes. But um, like I said, um, those who can receive training or come to our training center, first of all, they need to be qualified as a pension re labor pension receiver. And since you are a student, um, it will be a little bit tricky for you because you are not yet qualified for labor pension. And actually, we have um, some resources available on the internet. There is um, there is a capacity building homepage in Ministry of Labor on um, somewhere on our official website. For example, you want to um, look at the um, green energy training. Yes, we have some available resources. But um, for Ministry of Labor, I mean, from our perspective, um, maybe it's only after you are employed and be qualified for labor pension, then um, you are qualified to use all these resources. I didn't get the question. Can you elaborate the question a bit? Uh, For ESG, I mean, there are different spectrums, different issues. But it looks like the, gov uh, the companies, they pay less attention to human rights issues. So it could be a problem of the framework or the um, measuring indicators. But um, why is that? Yes, that's a good question. I, loved, I, I would love to ask this same question to companies. Yeah, I, let me try to answer your question. This is my assumption. I can try to answer your question. The, first of all, it could be a quantification. Say salary or working hours, there may be different definitions in different countries. People have different lifestyles, so the benchmark may not be aligned. That's why um, companies, maybe they are not very, um, it's, uh, they are not very uh, attentive to this issue because in different countries there are different conditions. And for human rights conventions, um, I think it's a very new idea that companies are asked to pay attention or respond to human rights issues. And I would say companies are still learning how to respond to this issue. And But I share the confusion with you. So I would like to answer this question as well. Um, in ESG report, especially S, sustainability, if you look at the report, um, the Quantifiable indicators are not clear. Let me show with you an example. Um, for example, um, for women and also um, equality issues, um, a lot of times they look like just slogans and there is no precise and very clear explanations. Um, in Ministry of Labor, actually, um, as I was invited to today's meeting, but um, actually in my ministry, there was another meeting asking me to attend. And that was about um, identifying the labor rights indicators. 
so that when the companies are filling in their ESG report, they have clear guidelines. As we look at green economy, we can find clues from the ESG report, and it's like we can picture their roadmap, whether this company is all the way qualified and fulfilling the standards. And I can guarantee, I can reassure you, the Ministry of Labor in Taiwan, we are working on it. And within three months, um, we will complete the review of these labor rights indicators. And later, we will work with the financial control authorities, and we will ask the companies to fulfill this um, information disclosure demand in their ESG report. Maybe next year, for those public companies um, bigger than two billion, they will have to fulfill. I mean, this new questionnaire um, by 2025. Um, the new law will be um, public companies under two billion would have to um, complete the survey. So now, in Ministry of Labor, we are uh, identifying, clarifying all these different indicators. We want to have a holistic view. Thank you. So, uh, third question is from journalist from uh, TEJ. CSDDD um, is just confirmed, very new, but we've observed EU practices for a long time in their sustainable taxonomies. Human rights is included. For example, there are six. Uh, environmentally friendly indicators that can't um, be against human rights. So human rights is embedded in how EU designs their indicators. So uh, I'm also an alumni, an NTU alumni. So I think they would set different standards depending on uh, context. So all the sustainability factors cover human right considerations. So that's why they don't have they don't single out human rights as an element under CSDDD. They could uh, be pursued at the same time. And in Taiwan, uh, our authority is also promoting uh, its own version of sustainability taxonomy. I, th I think it's the first step. And researcher Sun mentioned that uh, the uh, the MOEA um, has relevant policies. We also have a draft on human rights. We know that now it's a soft initiative, but if we combine soft initiative or when soft initiative turns into hard regulation, um, we would better know how it plays out, its effect, and uh, businesses, to be honest, um, would have more time to prepare for it, to communicate to stakeholders. And now with this global trend towards net zero sustainability, I think businesses need to speed up. Thank you for all the questions and uh, answers. Professor Zhou, please. I have a question for uh, Department Chief. And I think we've heard a lot of exciting discussions, right, for the sustainability transformation. In the morning, we talked about IFRS S1, S2, and uh, TCFD, how it can be incorporated into annual report. Uh, there has to be trade-offs, maybe um, regulation amendments. But we heard many questions in the Securities and Exchange Act. There isn't relative clause. So that's the first thing. And businesses need to write two reports, right? So compromise has to be made. And then I don't know if uh, Mr. Lin, Director Lin, is still here. He said that FSC, they would require companies to take approaches to promote just transition. And we would run into the same set of challenges again because there's no 
legal requirement for companies to do so. And then if you do include them, make them into law, there's no penalty, there's no binding uh, effect. So this is a question for transition. In this transitional period, do we need to amend the Securities and Exchange Act? And my question is for uh, Mr. Wang. For the carbon fees, there is a five-year grace period. So now the MOEA has set up a CSDDD task force, and I'm not, I don't think they would make it a hard regulation. I know MOEA is very powerful, but they need to consider politics, uh, economic development. And you mentioned uh, uh, labor rights would also be incorporated into sustainability report, but again, there it's not required by law. So I hope this forum is really uh, enlightening and it identifies many challenges. But I don't I don't know how they can be addressed in practice. Last question. Of on CSDDD, we have a human rights action plan. We also have guidelines for supply chains to honor human rights. So I want to ask uh, researcher Sun if you think it's necessary to have regulation. How should we? Where should we begin? My idea is that if we amend the Securities and Exchange Act, uh, CSDDD only looks at scale, size, right? So our act might not be applicable. We might need to look at the Company Act. And for due diligence, it says companies do their own due diligence. But what's the difference between that and a normal information disclosure? So last two questions. I think it's great. Uh, the two questions will be directed to the three panelists. So last round of answering, please. Thank you, Professor Zhou. I've been working as a civil servant for three decades, and it's very, very difficult to amend a law unless it's due to massive external pressure. Because the bills, when they enter the legislative yuan, there are many challenges. It will take a lot of time, a lot of hassle. But we at the government have uh, some tools. So uh, I would just share from the Labor of Mini uh, Ministry of Labor's perspective. Uh, I, I would also take your feedback uh, back to uh, and uh, bring it up when we dis have discussions with the FSC. But I always say that before regulations are developed, we, we need to take actions first. Um, government, the government has tools uh, that could work hand in hand with companies. For example, you know, we have food delivery, delivery platforms, operators. Um, three years ago on a typhoon day, you would be able to get your order get your foods. But in recent years, when a typhoon alert is announced, all the platforms will be closed. Why? That's the negotiation or collaboration we have with these platforms to honor uh, labor rights, to protect human rights. So now major food delivery platforms uh, are working with us
it's a gentleman's agreement. So once there is a typhoon alert announced, the platforms will be down, not in service. Uh, the same goes when there is strong rainfall. So before legal amendments, we are already taking proactive actions to prevent uh, incidents from happening, to protect human rights, labor rights. So we start from a soft approach, and it, it can still uh, make an impact. It might just not be as powerful as uh, hard regulations, but still we can work with the private sector uh, to make adjustments. And we would try, uh, we would make an effort on the regulation side, and I would bring this message back. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Zhou. Yeah, I have to answer this question, but this is um, what I'm very good at. Let me be humble. So as a economics major, I think having a law to build a proper environment, it's essential, but it takes time. And like you mentioned, whether it should be a hard law, is it mandatory, compulsory? How can we um, accelerate or guide these companies in their compliance journey? Personally, I would say, as I look at um, international references, like G20, CSDDD, it's actually just an initiative. So for different countries, they can evaluate their own conditions. And the companies, they voluntarily comply with this initiative. Or maybe the government, they allocate some resources to look for um, participation from the government. Or they can promote success examples, user cases. So these are things we can do at a preliminary stage. So we do something, and then it takes time to accumulate experiences. And among these companies, um, all these experience, uh, all these experiences become consensus, and uh, parallelly, um, the government has the time to um, set up the law. Well, I no longer work in the government, so <laughs> I cannot say things like 2020. Um, thank you for the questions. Allow me to rephrase the um, question. Actually, we already have some human rights initiatives in the companies. There are some guidelines and projects. So speaking of guidelines, yes, we are very supportive for this human rights guide, uh, guideline, guidelines. So for Taiwan's company, if we want to be qualified for international standards, yes, we should start with these initiatives. But um, is now after or after all, a draft is just a initiative. But if we look at corporate human rights action plan, well, in Taiwan, the first draft was passed um, 2020, at the end of 2020, and now we are upgrading this. We are revising this to 4.0. But I would say this is still soft. There is no timeline, and there is no dedicated authority concern or resources allocated. Actually, just a few months ago, um, um, I attended a UN meeting. And actually, for any initiative, I mean, to be ratified as a law, I mean, it's really a long journey. And in Taiwan, certainly we need to be practical. It's not that we don't have to stipulate all these regulations, but we need to have a timeline. It's like who, what, which, how to make this happen. We need to have a clear timeline and a roadmap. It's like the government has to show determination, like how to do it, how to complete it. It's not just making announcements, but if there's no budget, no resources, then there's nothing going to happen. It's like um, if you compare this 4.0 draft with the first version, um, 2020, actually we're not seeing much difference. Well, if we only, uh, to answer your question, if we only look at the exchange and start um, aspect we only deal with public company, but a lot of um, similar cases take place 
in private companies. So um, for us, I would say um, we would like to set up special um, chapters or special regulations in the company law. And in response to Professor Cho's sharing, in Taiwan, I mean, with our um, political challenges, um, it's not, I, was, I wouldn't say it's positive to build up a legal framework um, like this. Um, I'm not very positive with it because in the world, around the world, we already see a lot of hard laws of the same purpose available in Europe, also UK, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, United States, they all have it. But in Taiwan, yes, we do have some challenges, it's difficult. But speaking of our role in the global supply chain, if we do not catch the trend, um, it will be just more difficult in the future. So if we look at Second World War, or maybe post-World War II, um, for ESG petition, the life cycle, I mean, the petition for ESG, the life cycle is about six or seven years. So it's really a soft law. Um, human right protection, international trading, and in the world post-war, um, topics like this is just too soft. And as a moderator, allow me to take advantage of two minutes. Um, in the United States, there's a Rolling Stone magazine, and William Glider, a very famous columnist, and he have written a very good book, The End Station of Globalization. It's a heavy book, more than 800 pages. And in the book, you can see a lot of global companies, the bad conduct to make money, even um, killing people just for the sake of making more money. So it's really a difficult question. Don't forget, even the United States a lot of state governments, they try to skip um, environmental law. They are trying to allure um, global companies saying that, yeah, here you can evade some environmental um, regulations. For example, um, the en uh, engine company from Germany, they set up a company, uh, a plant, in a southern part of U.S. because in that part of U.S. Um, they didn't have to obey certain environmental protection law. So that's really a scandal in the world. So in response to all, number one is that we need to do something, otherwise we will miss the time. And number two, um, for soft law, it's more like a ritual. We need to make it hard law. And number three, um, any propositions it could be ethical, it could be something um, proper that we all agree on that's really nice. But if there's no capacity, meaning that it's not inclusive, then it would it's doomed, it's doomed to fail. Say, for example, there is a um, snake in India. Um, there are so many um, exotic animals in India, and the British governors, they want to um, take control. They want to make sure these exotic animals do not hurt people. So they set up a law that if you can catch one of those, I will give you a lot of money. And then in UK, they have a new business around it. So back to our um, issue, um, speaking of um, greenhouse emission, if it's a business exchange, it's like if I give you some subsidies, if you can give up some carbon emission, then actually a lot of companies, they try to qualify themselves for this. And they are actually making excessive or more than needed um, carbon emission. And that's actually the other way around if compared to what the law really wanted. So everyone, now that um, thank our um, panelists again with a round of applauses. Thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing. And now we are going to have a group photo together. So please um, stand up and just stay where you are. Thank you.